episode of Australian Health Journal. This month we report on the recent ARCS Australia conference held in Sydney. For over 30 years, ARCS Australia has been bringing together a vibrant and diverse community of professionals working within academia, government, biopharmaceutical companies, hospitals and healthcare, as well as independent organisations. The ARCS annual conference is the largest on regulation, reimbursement, clinical research and the utilisation of medical technologies and therapeutics in the ANZ region. Let's hear from ARC CEO Shani Dyer about the organisation and the conference. Hey, I'm Shani Dyer, the CEO of ARCS Australia, and we're here at the ARCS 2018 conference. How do we affect patient outcomes? Um, are we doing things differently? Really compelling session this morning about uh, disruption and innovation. That's what I think that you guys are all about. Um, you're not here to do a job, you're here to, to make a difference to, to patients. Hi, I'm Shani Dyer, uh, CEO of ARCS Australia. So we're here at the last day of the ARCS 2018 conference. We've had a wonderful three days of information, networking and, and sharing with everybody uh, from speakers to delegates uh, and our members. Really, ARCS is about enabling people to understand what's happening in our sector, uh, the changes and, and really the, the industry life experiences that, that um, will enable people to do their jobs in this sector. We're, our sector is highly regulated, um, there's a lot of guidance around what we do, it's global. So being able to uh, educate and uh, you know, share information is incredibly important. And that's why it's important to be a member of ARCS. Um, you become a member of a community uh, where uh, everybody helps each other uh, to, sh to share experience. If they've had uh, some information around regulations, they share it with everybody. Uh, and uh, that, that's what we're here for. We're to provide that mechanism to enable people to understand how to do their job better. So uh, we, we, we have, a, uh, as a member-based member organisation, we're a not-for-profit. Uh, we really are our members. Uh, if you're not part, if you're not an arts professional, then you're not in the industry. So um, come along and talk to us about membership. Uh, we'd love to see you. We'd love you to be part of who we are. We uh, are taking a, a big position in relation to training but also advocacy uh, in the sector, talking to governments and, and other companies to see how we can do things better. So come along, be a member, uh, be an ARCS professional. Also at the ARCS annual conference were Novartis. More broadly known for pharmaceuticals, Novartis had on display their augmented reality headset, which, when used in an educational setting, allows students to walk through in three dimensions of the brain in a patient with multiple sclerosis using MRI data. What makes this more unique is the fourth dimension of time to give the ability of students to see the progression of the disease over 10 years. January 2013. The patient experiences a clinical relapse. Let's now see Inside MS and hear about the collaboration with Sydney Neuroimaging Analysis Centre, also known as SNAC and the Hatch Design Team. My name is Rob Walker, I'm uh, Associate Medical Advisor in the Neuroscience Team at Novartis working in Multiple Sclerosis. Hi, I'm um, Stefan, I'm the Medical Manager for the Neuroscience Portfolio in Novartis. This is device is, uh, has been developed um, um, in Novartis um, in order to try to improve the engagement of the doctor and understanding the disease, understanding how um, 
MRI can be uh, understood by your patients and how we can improve the way how the patients can um, understand uh, MRI. I mean, this is an augmented reality display. And I think the important thing that you get out of viewing data, or in this case, a patient's MRI data, is that it's very immersive. The McDonald's 2017 criteria permit a diagnosis of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, RRMS, to be made at the time of first clinical presentation based upon evidence of dissemination in time on brain MRIs. This is a very complex disease and what's important about it is you can see changes in MS with MRI data. We can demonstrate over a very long time, in this case 10 years, just how the brain changes. Mm. And that's a really important message for people trying to understand MS for the first time and understand how changes in imaging data, in MRI, uh, correlate with changes in what the patient experiences. Mm. So we feel this could have a really important role in educating the next generation of neurologists about MS. I wanted to show you the traditional way we would demonstrate a patient's MRI to them or to, for instance, a medical student. Uh, and this has now become a very critical component of a consultation with the patient, taking them through their MRI data, because a lot of the disease activity in MS and other brain diseases is subclinical. In other words, it's not overt. The patient may not be aware of what's going on. You do an MRI scan, it provides a lot more information. So it's very important to convey that to the patient. And the way we would normally do it is show uh, a two-dimensional representation of the brain, which is divided into slices, uh, which can, I'll start at the bottom of the brain down here, and then as I scroll up, you can see the slices going up the patient's head, eyes being at the front, nose, back of the head, ears on either side. Right is left, left is right. And in this case, this is, in fact, uh, an example of multiple sclerosis, and you can see the typical periventricular around the ventricles as they're called white matter lesions and these are patches of uh, inflammation and scarring or sclerosis which gives the disease its name but without domain knowledge it's very hard for either a student or a patient to look at this sort of two-dimensional representation and come to, to grips with what the disease is doing, what parts of the brain the disease is affecting. Um, and so we, we do this, uh, and I do this on a daily basis with patients, but it is very difficult and the patients clearly when they're looking at this for the first time are, are, are quite uh, perplexed by it. So um, we wanted um, with Novartis to develop a tool that was able to uh, convey or impart this sort of information to the patient in a format with which they would be um, more comfortable or at least would be more meaningful to them. And of course, a three-dimensional representation of the brain is much easier to grasp and using augmented reality, virtual reality or tools like that is something that really allows the patient to sort of become heavily involved in their own disease and a student to come to grips with what is happening in the brain of a patient with a disease like this in an instant rather than having to learn or come to grips with the details of MR imaging which is something that takes a degree of time. Well when we first started looking into you know what sort of tool we could develop to you know better educate on multiple sclerosis the first thing we did was um, approach two different parties in addition to Novartis. Uh, one was Hatch Australia, a group who helped us understand innovative tools like augmented reality and another were um, some key experts in multiple sclerosis. So Professor Michael Barnett and Dr. Timothy Wang at Sydney Neuroimaging Analysis Centre in Sydney. So my name is Peter Thompson. Um, I am the co-director at Hatch Australia and I am the experience maker within the company. And I'm Michelle Menken. Uh, I'm a creative strategist. What we're finding with this tool um, is that people are much uh, are able to understand um, what's actually going on um, by the three-dimensional visualization of it um, a lot better than they have been able to with their existing MRI scans. The journey with them has been one of a trying to figure out what should the medical story be um, that best uh, shares an educational story for student doctors and potentially patients on what it looks like uh, as new lesions form in the brain over that 10 year period and also what are the other uh, trackers we should be identifying through that journey 
whether that be from uh, an EDSS score to uh, the, the medical treatment they were receiving, whether it's injectable or orals, uh, and what other information can we provide along the way, including some of the MRI scans when there are relapsing points, etc., cetera, through um, that patient's journey. Uh, my name is Tim Wen, and I'm currently the uh, Director of Operations at Sydney Neuroimaging Analysis Centre. And I'm also working as a research fellow at the Bright Animal Centre in University of Sydney. Uh, and I'm Michael Barnett. I'm a professor of neurology here at the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. Uh, I direct the multiple sclerosis clinic here, and I'm also in charge of the MS research stream at uh, the Brain and Mind Centre. In uh, the context of our discussion today, I uh, also work closely in collaboration with the Sydney Neuroimaging Analysis Centre, and in particular Tim Wang in the development of these collaborative programs between the BMC, University of Sydney, and SNAC. This key partnership between three parties ensured that we had a great clinical perspective in terms of you know, how MS changes and actually getting our hands on some really important patient level MRI data. Partnering with SNAC, we were able to you know, really get a great clinical perspective on how the tool could be designed. And also you know, working with Hatch, we got an understanding of how best to communicate that to you know, a new audience. The first time we, we presented this, um, this type of device and then and the model was um, in uh, last May in Melbourne and then we presented this, uh, this prototype, because it's still a prototype, mm -hmm. to um, top healthcare professionals, the neurologists that are seeing patients every day, patients with multiple sclerosis. The most used word in this meeting was wow. One of the interesting things we've done here is the Inside MS tool and I think that's a great example of a tool that can be used to teach students. I mean, I would like personally to see this put into university teaching courses and that is exactly what we're doing here at the uh, University of Sydney. We're going to try and put that into our neurosciences teaching block where we teach patients and we teach students already about brain imaging and brain disease, but not in this fashion. But this could be used in any chronic brain disorder, whether that's neuroinflammatory disease like MS, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, or even uh, malignancy, brain tumours, for instance. Yeah, so basically, um, that from the, techno the technical perspective, how um, this tool can be achieved essentially just needs a uh, sim simple uh, MRI scan, structure MRI scan. Then we can put all this, uh, uh, using the analysis technique we have, and construct this model and put into this tool. We clearly identify that um, um, Novartis is, uh, is wanted to be more and is more than, than a, a pharmaceutical industry but really being a healthcare industry and then for that we really wanted to add value of the product we are giving to the patients and this type of education tool our objectives is improve the quality of the use of the medicine is improve the outcome for our patients and adding that on top of what we deliver every day to the doctors and trying to to help the patients with with the treatment we are developing adding these type of tools will definitely improve the quality of the use of medicine, will improve how the doctors will treat their patients and identify the best patients for the best treatment. This year marked the 10 year anniversary of the TAVI device, short for the transcatheter aortic valve implantation. The TAVI system enables the replacement of a diseased aortic valve without open heart surgery or surgical removal of the native valve. This minimally invasive surgical option reduces operating time and allows for a shortened recovery period for patients. We met with the cardiologist teams in Melbourne's Epworth and Alfred Hospital who have been involved in implanting the device over the past 10 years. I started uh, doing TAVI at the Alfred in August 2008. Uh, at that time, TAVI was pretty much in its infancy uh, in this country, let alone anywhere around the world. So we were the first site in Victoria to start TAVI. And uh, as you can imagine, it was pretty adventurous times and it was a new technology. There was uh, a considerable amount of resistance to us starting TAVI. And I certainly remember our first couple of patients extremely well. And uh, you develop a, a sort of fairly intimate relationship with those particular patients as they uh, entrust you with their lives to do these procedures. Well, the so first TAVI procedure um, as a we were talking about it. So I went and did my training across at the Alfred 
And so my proctoring occurred via Tony and with Stephen Duffy at the Alfred Hospital for about a year before it came here to Whipworth. And uh, so by the time it came here, I'd already gone through all the hoops and we'd seen a lot of different things. And in those days, it was the old system, which made it even more exciting than it should have been. And uh, we um, basically got most of the skills from then. Nevertheless, we did six cases over two days then. And we had a proctor, Jean-Claude Laborde, who was very good and talked us through the cases. And uh, they went really well. And a couple of those patients from that first round are still alive now, 10 years down the line. Well, I'm just an ordinary person. I was enjoying life, playing bowls. And, uh, well, I used to get this bad pain around the left side and I didn't know it was the heart at the time. So, and I've had, well, little or no trouble with it ever since. Now, I think uh, what they've done for me must uh, give me another 10 years. Might get another 12 years. <laughs> I don't know. And probably... As far as I know, the reason why I've got this, is this extra time is because of what he was able to do for me. And I think I was a guinea pig at the time. What a su success it has been, for sure. Well, the, most, the most memorable thing uh, with the patients that receive a TAVI is how fast they recover. And usually they're a bit low and slow for the first two days but then they start to bounce back quite quickly and by the time they're discharged, they are a lot further ahead than they would have been if they'd had an aortic valve replacement. Uh, and especially in this age group, because the over 80s um, do take at least three to six months to recover from a bypass and aortic valve, or bypass run and an aortic valve implantation. And the memorable part is the way they come back in about four weeks and they're feeling well and they are doing much more than they could do previously. And their scores have all improved. So to get the program started was, it was you know, for me, a big, uh, very satisfying and a big achievement. And that's now developed into you know, one, of our, one of the leading programs in the country. So we're delighted to be part of what's been an amazing, transforming technology. I think it's very satisfying professionally when you can adapt a new technology and get good results. Um, and our results I think are as good as if not better than anywhere else in the world so that's been a very satisfying thing to do professionally. Hi my name is Christine Zarin and I am uh, the co-founder and director of the White Coats Foundation. Um, the White Coats Foundation is all about supporting the discovery of better health through um, awareness about clinical trials and providing people with resources to learn more about clinical trials and clinical trial participation. My background is in nursing. I'm a Division I registered nurse in Victoria. I've worked in healthcare for over 25 years now. Um, predominantly in clinical trials research, initially as a clinical trial coordinator, but then I also managed a dermatology research unit at, at the Skin and Cancer Foundation in Carlton for about five years. Um, I also had established my own patient matching recruitment service called Clinical Trials Connect, which has just recently merged with ClinTrial Refer, uh, and I've currently moved across to CTR as the business development manager. Um, I'm very passionate about clinical trials and patients having access to clinical trial opportunities. As a nurse or a former clinical trial nurse coordinator, uh, I've worked at the front line and seen the difference that access to a clinical trial can make in people's lives. And I've also seen clinical trials fail to meet their recruitment targets um, resulting in missed opportunities for patients. So I'm very passionate about ensuring that people have a pathway to access the information to these potentially life-changing opportunities. And so my work with CTR is really dedicated to access to clinical trial information and my work um, with the White Coats Foundation is really all about creating awareness about clinical trials and clinical trial participation and how to gain access to these opportunities. 
In 2016, um, INC Research, who are now Senior's Health and CIS Group in America, ran a crowd-solving competition called the Inspiring Hope Ideathon. Um, they were seeking ideas from people around the world on how to raise awareness about clinical trials and clinical trial participation. I submitted an entry at the time and my idea was selected as one of 14 finalists from around the globe. Um, I flew to Boston to present that idea and although it didn't win at the time, the organisers um, were so inspired by my concept that they decided to sponsor the development of it anyway um, and that was launched earlier this year. So that concept was actually a video that um, thanks volunteers uh, for their role in the drug development process and the role they play um, in helping bring new medicines to market. As, as part of the concept um, that was launched earlier this year being the thank you video, um, the other part of that was to have a website that would act as a resource for um, the general public and healthcare professionals to be able to access information about clinical trials and that was also launched in conjunction with a video earlier this year on International Clinical Trials Day. The Thank You video was um, the first of many projects to come that will be launched through the White Coats Foundation. Uh, we have lots of initiatives in the pipeline that are all aimed at raising awareness about clinical trials and clinical trial participation. We hope to have more information available uh, early 2019. We're currently in the process of talking with sponsors and um, to people that could assist with funding some of these initiatives and we're very excited about the potential launch of some of these projects. That brings us to the end of another episode of Australian Health Journal. Join us again next time. Until then, goodbye.